we have palm branches in honor of that whole idea, singing or shouting Hosanna to the King. We'll get to that part of the scripture in just a moment. But if, uh, if you're brand new here or haven't been here in the past few weeks, let me kind of get you up to speed and we're going to talk about a couple pieces of the Bible and then jump into what typically we talk about on Palm Sunday. Uh, we've been talking about loving our neighbor and we've been doing that through this season that we call Lent. The Lent meaning preparation and anticipation, kind of an old school term of that sense and ancient Christians and modern Christians both have oftentimes decided that uh, during that season of preparation it would be good for us to deny ourselves and it's to deny ourselves sometimes people give up eating sweets for a period of time um, certain church traditions would not eat meat on Fridays and so you get uh, fish offered all across the town of course um, sometimes people would give up things like television uh, and saying you know I'm going to deny myself I'm going to kind of focus in on the Lord so preaching on loving our neighbor that fits perfectly because here we are we're trying to love our neighbor, which means that as I love my neighbor, I have to deny myself. And so if you're brand new here, you haven't been here in a few weeks, then you think about loving your neighbor. Does that make sense? Are you with me? And last week we talked about our, our literal neighbor that's living right next to us, but today we're talking about more spontaneous types of interactions. So let's go to Luke chapter, 20, or chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, verse 27. And this particular scripture is where we kind of root ourselves in thinking about how to live, loving God, loving our neighbor. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Who said that? Jesus. So we celebrate him a couple thousand years ago, God's word coming flesh, teaching, and then us then carrying on that tradition, talking to and writing to different people, trying to understand how to live it's not just about me. It's not all about me. It's not all about you. It's about all of us together, loving the Lord God and then loving our neighbors ourselves. As we do that, the little parts of the world around us get transformed. As all of us individually do our part, the world around us and the community around us gets transformed. In the midst of that, then we think about, okay, who's my neighbor? And we have literal neighbors to love. But then, Today, with the bulletin cover, let me see here. I know I have a bulletin. Here we go. I invite you to look at the front of your bulletin cover. And no, this is not a picture of Jonathan Rodriguez, our youth director, but I didn't realize it looked like him until today. And somebody said, hey, Jonathan's on the front. And I'm like, well, not exactly. Um, this is just, uh, just a picture that, that Kara in our office uh, uh, came up with that kind of uh, was, you know, to her made her think of spontaneous conversations and interactions and I love it when I looked at it I thought oh my goodness what a good illustration we can build off of because if this were a scene in a TV show what would be going through the minds of the guys and the girl in this picture like typically right start thinking about that all right now, I know this is church but nonetheless culturally speaking this is a TV show, and you have this encounter, and the guys have that huge smile, shaking hands with this blonde lady. I can think of a particular TV show where the blonde lady would be a pharmaceutical sales rep using her looks to sell the pharmaceuticals. Some of you know the TV show I'm talking about. And in the guys' minds, they're first thinking, hubba hubba. And... The lady may be thinking, hubba hubba, <laughs> or, you know, maybe thinking, well, wait a second, are they smiling because of my looks or, or because I'm doing a good job? Are they treating me nicely because they're just nice people, or is there more to that? And vice versa, you know, what's she thinking? And in our culture, we have one understanding of how that goes down, but Christians are called to be atypical unusual, countercultural, which means that in this type of a setting, the guys might be looking at the lady saying to themselves, oh, she's gorgeous, but wait a second. Does she know Jesus? How is she doing really? What's going on in her life? How can I be a blessing to her in this particular situation? And the lady was in a countercultural kind of perhaps Christian orientation, 
interacts with these guys and starts thinking, do they know Jesus? Do they know the love of God? How can I show them Jesus' kindness in what I say and what I do? That may sound weird, but I guarantee you, you have interacted with somebody, and I bet it was somebody even from this church, but I guarantee you, you have interacted with somebody who, even though you were talking about something just kind of standard, in the back of that other person's mind, they were praying for you. Like, no joke. I can guarantee you there's been somebody you interacted with, and maybe you're just talking about, you know, Loyola's basketball team with Clayton Custer, right? I had to mention it. That's pretty amazing. I don't know very many Custers in the basketball world, right? But there you go. Maybe you're just talking about that, but in the back of their mind, they're praying, God, would you help them? God, would you encourage this person, you know? And they're talking to you, and they're praying for you in the back of their mind because Christians start to learn to do that because every encounter with somebody else from a Christian point of view is a divine opportunity to share God's love. Every single opportunity that you have to talk to somebody is an opportunity for you to bless them or curse them. The Christian worldview changes the way that we start seeing people. And it is bizarre, but it's also really exciting because you start walking around on mission. You're on a mission from God to be able to bless other people around you. It's pretty awesome. Where do we get this? Well, we get it from the scripture. And sometimes Jesus says things that really drive this message home, even to an uncomfortable setting or, or uncomfortable level. For instance, Matthew 25, verses 41 to 46. Jesus is talking about kind of this judgment scene where people have died and they're before the Lord. And it, it says, Then he will say to those on his left, it's kind of like God speaking, those on his left, Depart from me, who, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. And they will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. And then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So does it matter how we respond to people in spontaneous encounters? Oh yeah, like hugely. There is a lot at stake in terms of when we interact with folks it could be very well that we are treating Jesus with how we are treating those people. Now notice it says one of the least of these. We're talking about people that have no ability to help themselves. We're not talking about people that are taking advantage of other folks, but at the end of the day, you know, they've got a job or they could you know, provide for themselves. We're talking about the least, 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 least. We're talking about the people that have nobody else that can possibly help them, and there they are. We can help, but if we don't, we're turning our back on Jesus. Not a good idea in the Bible. You probably didn't need me to say that. You understood that. That's not a good idea. But in the same time, what a wonderful opportunity that every time we encounter somebody, we have the ability to possibly bless Jesus as we love those people as our neighbor and love them as ourselves. That is crazy amazing. I wanted to keep that in mind as we look at the typical Palm Sunday scripture passage. And I want to look at how Jesus interacts with people in kind of those spontaneous ways, and then how the people interact with Jesus in those ways, their response. I'm going to do at least two, maybe three side trails, asides, rabbit trails. Have you ever tried to actually follow an actual rabbit trail? It is miserable, but this is going to be fun because rabbits are very small and they go through real thicket kind of stuff and you're all thorns and stuff. These are going to be pleasant rabbit trails, okay? Little asides. You ready? So first to the scripture, Matthew 21. As they approached Jerusalem, 2,000 years ago, Jesus and the disciples coming toward Jerusalem. They came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says to you, says anything to you, Say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, quote, 
Say to daughter Zion, Zion being the Old Testament word for Jerusalem, either the physical Jerusalem in this life or the one to come in kind of that heavenly realm, in this case the physical Jerusalem. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Palm branches. Why do we have cut palm branches? This part of the story, reminding us of what happened. This is Jesus' last time coming into Jerusalem as the physical man on earth who's going to die for our sins. Where is he going to get arrested and killed? In that Jerusalem area, okay? But as he's coming in, certain folks are recognizing he's the king. He's a king coming in, fulfilling scripture, fulfilling the prophecy. They're excited. They cut the branches. They put them down on the ground. The crowds that went on ahead of him and those that followed shouted. And let's say this together, all right? You ready? Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts. Mm, This is an interesting switch. They're all excited. Everything's going great. He's coming into town. He's going to the temple to worship, just like most of the pilgrims at that time. And here he is. He's going in. And what's he do? It says, And drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw that the saw the wonderful things that he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants? You, Lord, have called forth your praise. Let's wait for a second. In American culture, sometimes people will say, from the mouths of babes. You've heard that, probably. And when they say that, they're usually referring to something that a little kid says that's true, something insightful that you wouldn't expect a kid to realize. This is where that comes from, with the idea being the kids understood who Jesus was better than the adults did, (laughs) and they're praising him. And Jesus is like, yeah, I hear them, and it's great. This is wonderful. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. Roughly, approximately a couple thousand years ago, Jesus, he comes in to town, then he goes back out of town. So you've got kind of like the little suburbs around Jerusalem. He and the disciples are staying on the outskirts of town, kind of come in and going into town, out of town. And when they come into town, that's like going into a city that's hosting the Olympics. Got a lot of other people from all over the world. Why? Because this is like their Christmas and Fourth of July all together. It's Passover time, Passover time which for Jews was the beginning of their country. That's why I say 4th of July, because that was when Moses led them out of Egypt and out of slavery to become their own people, the people of God, and this this new promised land is where they're headed. And Passover being this religious holiday because they worshiped the fact that God saved them from slavery, passed over them when he was breathing destruction on their oppressors. This is an important time. You've got people from all over. It's packed. Jesus comes in. Some people recognize who he is. Some don't. The people that recognize him best are the disciples. So you've got Jesus interacting with people, and you've got different groups of people interacting with him spontaneously. You have the disciples. You have kids. You have some people in the crowd. And then you have, eventually, the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes, the leaders, the, the religious leaders. In that setting... Two groups kind of get it really right about who Jesus is. When Jesus rides into town and they're worshiping him, you know, and that kind of thing, the disciples understand better than anybody else, except for the kids, who Jesus is. So now this is an aside. Let me talk about that for a second. 
disciples. How many really, really close disciples did Jesus have? You can't count them on two hands, can you? You need two, two uh, toes. That's what those are called down here. Thank you very much. Thanks for knowing what I was talking about. All right. So you, you got 12, right? 12 disciples, small group, small group of people. The crowd in this story, when you read it in the Bible, the crowd goes fickle. Because some of those folks that are a crowd that are excited about Jesus seem not to be excited later on when the religious leaders get him arrested and killed. And then they start shouting, not Hosanna, but crucify him, right? So in the crowd, sometimes you can be swayed. But they had this small group of disciples who really cared for each other, lived together in a way that, that where they were knowing each other, they were praying for each other, their families were together, they, they were focused on Jesus. So after Easter, when we do kind of another renewal of this whole small group idea, small group idea, where are we getting that? It's because we know that Jesus showed us we need that and that that helps us to understand who Jesus is. A lot of the uh, adults otherwise, they didn't get it, right? So there you go. Um, that was a free commercial for small groups, life groups, available now for 1995. There you go, all right? Now, then what happened? He went to the temple to pray and worship. Now, the temple, hmm. When he gets to the temple, that's a whole different situation. So we've got group life. Hey, guys, would you go to the next slide there with the, with the temple? Because we've got this picture then of him coming in, and he's grabbing onto the tablecloth that's covering the table, and he's ripping it away, and he's, he's turning over tables and stuff. Why is he doing that? Some of you already know. You may remember this from, from years ago, but here we go. When pilgrims would travel to the temple, this is still the time of temple sacrificing. So you still had the Old Testament sacrifices still in play because Jesus had not yet been the one sacrifice for all time. So when you would travel a long way, you couldn't easily take with you the animals that you needed to sacrifice. You needed to buy the animals when you were there. You go to King's Island, you go to Cedar Point, and you go to buy a bottle of water that you could get at the supermarket for like 25 cents, and how much did they charge? <laughs> Four, five, six, seven dollars, right? It's like they take advantage of the fact that you've traveled a long way and there's only one place where you can buy this stuff. These religious leaders were doing the same thing. Why does the Bible mention doves? There are other animals that were being bought. Why does it mention doves? Because that's what you would buy if you were poor. And Jesus sees them jacking the price up on doves, taking advantage of these poor people. You want to make Jesus real mad? You take advantage of poor people. That, I mean, pff, I mean, you know, when Jesus starts talking about hell, a lot of times he's, he's putting in there some way that we're mistreating poor people that are vulnerable or that are, are sick or lame or, or just can't do anymore. I mean, they're just, they're vulnerable. We can't take advantage of those folks or God's just ticked. Not only that, but their, their hearts aren't right. These, these religious leaders should have been using what was given really, really responsibly. It's part of why the Old Testament is so long in certain parts, there are a lot of rules on how you're supposed to do things at the temple. And they're not doing it with mercy and justice, and they're not taking care of it. How, you, how we treat people and how we use our money is a really big deal. Here's a side number two. And in your bulletin, there was a little insert that talked about money. Did you see it? Everybody loves to talk about money at church. It astounds me. Mark, every, every few days I get somebody saying, why don't you preach more about money? It is crazy. No, I, that, that's not true. I, that was a, I was just, just joking, just joking. All right. Now, transforming the world together. This includes about halfway down, maybe two-thirds of the way down, a testimony from me that's a confession of mine. Whew. Now, I'll talk about it today. We're not talking about it at Easter. I don't want you to bring new people and then us talk about money and then go home and say, all that does, church does is talk about money. We're not doing that, all right? We're talking death and resurrection of Jesus and encountering Jesus and following Jesus. But right now and then after Easter, well, later on, we will talk a little bit more about money. And I'm putting myself right there saying, I haven't been giving what I should be giving financially to support the work of the church. And I'm going to correct that. And Jennifer and I have been talking about that, and we're going to be back on the right track because we're underfunding some of our ministries. 
And if I'm part of the problem, well, I got to get my life right before I start preaching about it, right? Otherwise, I put myself in the Pharisees' camp, and we're not doing that. I don't want to be that, okay? And then how are we going to do that? Well, one of the things I realize is for myself, before God and this company, I say, the pledge card idea I didn't realize was so helpful for me. So we haven't done pledge cards in a long time. And if it's a helpful thing for you, we're going to make them available. If it's not helpful, then that's fine. But trying to sit down and say with you or maybe your, your family and say, how much should we give to support God's ministry? What is the Lord leading us to do? It can be very helpful to say, I'm going to kind of write that down. I'm going to declare that. So you could take this, you could read it. This was the other option that I found online that we could do the pledge cards this way. So you've got Pastor Juan got very excited about the Stewardship Committee's new idea. And he says, this should help us raise next year's budget. This is great. What's the Stewardship Pledge Card say? Well, step number one, how much do you make? And then you would write that down. Step number two, send it all in. Some of you will get that later. We're not doing it that way. However, if the Lord starts turning over the money tables of your own heart, you respond. You say, okay, Lord, what do you want? What should it be? How should I do that? The, the temple leaders, they didn't respond rightly. How do we know that? In part, we know that because within a few decades, God allowed the Romans to come in, destroy Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and to this day, there is no temple. What you pray out at the wailing wall is a wall. It's not the temple. It's there no longer. The religious leaders, they blew it. I don't want to blow it. I, don't, I know you guys don't want to either. There you go. That was another aside, another rabbit trail. Um, let's go back to the scripture. What happened? What happened in the scripture? Back to the Bible. When Jesus was at the temple, here we've got the fanciest of all churches of that day, so to speak. Top religious leaders are there. The people who should have been, should have been, excited and also taking palm branches and worshiping Jesus. There's religious leaders who many of them had the Bible memorized. Many of them copied it and copied it and just studied it and studied it. Those folks that were the real church-going folks, so to speak, they were the ones starting to point fingers at Jesus. Be quiet and tell those kids to be quiet about you. What are you doing? And in the back of their minds, instead of praying for people and praying for Jesus, in the back of their minds, they're plotting against Jesus. They're turning against him. Not only that, they're turning against the vulnerable people who are poor, sick, blind, lime, uh, lame, blind, those folks. The religious leaders are pointing at them saying, it's your fault. You know this from different things that Jesus says. Some of those religious leaders are saying, it's your fault you're blind. It's your family's fault that you're not well. You're sinners. We're obviously not because we can see and we're fine. They're accusing them. They're putting them down. And in the process, Jesus comes to those people with an open, outstretched hand saying, I don't judge and condemn you. I love you. I want to help heal you. I want to help deliver you. Hey, kid, I see you. I know your name. I care about you. That's Jesus. That's our religious leader. The one who then said, I love you all so much that on the cross when I'm dying for you, I'll pray, do you remember what he prayed? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's Jesus. That's his response to the people who are in need, who are vulnerable and weak. And he comes to them. And not only that, though, he's also dying for those judgmental hypocrites that had pointed their fingers at him and who had him killed. Interesting. He was, he was kind of offensive to them. He said some not so nice things because he was telling the truth about how those people were being judgmental. But in the midst of it, he also died for them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. In the midst of all that then, the question comes to us. Will be, we be people that we, when we encounter the people that, like in Matthew 21, we read, the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. When the chief priests and the teachers of the law, though, when they saw, they were indignant. They were mad. Will we be people that wherever we are, as we interact with those folks who need us and who are vulnerable and in need, 
Will we be the people that will be like Jesus and extend our hand, say, I see you, I care, I will love you. Even if other people get mad at me and are indignant, I don't care. I'm going to love you, I'm going to be there for you, I care about you. Which kind of people are we going to be? As I thought about that, I thought, I bet that Jesus, if he and Peter are watching us right now, no joke, I think he's like going to Peter, hey, Pete, look at these people that are down there next to that cornfield in Galloway. And Pete's like, where is that? And Jesus is like, it's right here. Look at this. Look at these people. Look at these people. Like, they are going to turn that community upside down with my love. They already have started. Pete, you got to watch these folks. It's going to be amazing because they love me and they love each other and they're going to really help their community. Jesus, we love you. You know that. We're also very imperfect, and you know that. So thank you for your love for us and your faithfulness to us. So help us this holy week to refocus on you and refocus all that we are and all that we have on you and to care about you so much that when we encounter other people, we start praying to you for them and speaking the words you want us to speak, and doing the things that you want us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.